Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for Grand Rounds. We have Sarah Moore today, and she's going to expand on the topic of yeast infections. So let me stop sharing my screen, Sarah. Okay. Oops. Let me get everything pulled up here. Share. Okay, here we go. All right, does that look okay? Do not see your screen. Nope, okay, my mistake. Okay, here we go. There we are, all right, perfect. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Tatiana. As we talked about last week, I'll be expanding on what Dr. Duncans had presented on as far as testing for yeast Canada infections. But today I'll be talking a little bit more on the interpretation and treatment side of that. So as far as objectives for today, we're going to discuss common types of Canada infections, risk factors, typical treatments, and then some resistance patterns. So this isn't intended to be all-encompassing or everything you would ever need to know about yeast infections, but it is a little bit of a start. So a quick disclaimer here. Dr. Junkins mentioned this last week, but we have a group of organisms that were all formerly known as Canada, and now we have a little bit of a mix as far as those names. That being said, when we're talking about the clinical syndromes that they cause, I'm going to be referring to them as a group. So just like Prince is always going to be Prince to us, in my mind, these will always be Canada. So we can't talk about Canada and Canada infections without acknowledging colonization. So like many other types of microorganisms, Canada are part of our normal flora. So when it comes to seeing where that Canada has actually grown from within the body, we can look at a couple different things and know straight off from the source, whether this is likely to be pathogenic or not. So first off, if this is grown from the respiratory tract, that's typically going to be a colonizer, um, especially if we're talking about like a deep respiratory culture. In that situation, most of the time, that's really not a pathogen. So Dr. Junkins hit on that last week, but on the clinical side, that's also what we would interpret that as. As far as potentially colonized, we might have things like the genitourinary tract, skin and soft tissue, or intra-abdominal spaces. Um, takes a little bit more nuance to maybe interpret that. And then last, sites that we do not think of as being colonized and are probably almost always exclusively going to be pathogenic, it's going to be the bloodstream, heart valves, central nervous system, or ocular the eyes. If we've got Canada species grown from there, then we're going to regard that as truly infection. So once again, like I said, this presentation isn't going to be all encompassing, but I did want to do a review of some of the Canada species infections that we do commonly see um, in both the inpatient and outpatient environment. So some of our heavy hitters are going to be vulvovaginal candidiasis or VVC, esophagitis, intra-abdominal infections, and candidemia, which is growth of Canada from the bloodstream. Now, when we're talking about any of these, before we go any further, we have to acknowledge that immunosuppression is a risk factor. So in general, we're talking about Canada, which is not going to be something that is particularly virulent. Oftentimes we're going to see bacterial infections way before we're going to see a Canada actually start to cause a problem. It is part of our normal flora. We usually coexist in perfect harmony. However, if the immune system is not working as well as it normally would, then that candida may start to have some overgrowth, may start to actually have um, a risk for infection. So that's going to be a risk factor for any type of candida um, that we talk about moving forward. So we'll start off with VVC, which is what we would colloquially refer to as a yeast infection. So this is something that we see very commonly in our female patients. As far as symptoms, we'll usually see things just like itching, irritation, vaginal discharge, Risk factors are going to be antibiotic exposure. And the reason for that is that antibiotics 
can kill off some of the normal bacterial flora within the vaginal space and basically allows for some overgrowth of candida species at that point. So if a patient's getting an antibiotic for a short course, we can still kind of see that VVC pop up as a side effect. Um, another risk factor can be a use of hormonal birth control. Um, we don't have as great of an understanding as to why that is a risk factor, but there is a correlation there. So just something to be aware of, as well as uncontrolled diabetes. And in that situation, we probably could have some low grade immunosuppression that might be contributing there or potentially some other just random changes in the normal flora. Um, hard for us to really say necessarily. As far as uh, diagnosis, we're typically talking about symptoms. So this is something that um, women are very much able to self-diagnose and we have over-the-counter treatments available, but we can also sometimes see it diagnosed by healthcare practitioners. And in that case, we might have a positive culture to help guide us as well. As far as therapies, we're typically looking at things like topical therapy. Again, that's often available over the counter. We may also do oral fluconazole for a single dose. And then we actually have a new player on the market, which is called a Brexafungurp, um, which is not something we're going to typically see. Um, I'll explain a couple of the gripes I have with this particular medication here. So Abrexafungurp, first off, has one of the most insane names for a drug I've ever heard. Very difficult to pronounce. Second, uh, when it was actually studied to be brought to market, it was compared to a placebo instead of our gold standard of care being some sort of topical therapy or oral fluconazole. That's not to say that it didn't work at all relative to placebo. It obviously was able to be brought to market for that reason. Uh, but I think it's a little bit um, inappropriate as far as a study design when it comes to actually bringing something to market to not compare to something we know that works really well. The last gripe I have, and the reason you probably won't ever see it used for VVC is the cost of the drug. So um, if you look in GoodRx or some sort of resource like that, a Brexafungurp is probably going to run five to $600 for most patients. And when we're looking at oral fluconazole or a topical therapy, we're typically talking maybe somewhere between five and $20. So a Brexafungurp, though it has this indication, is probably almost never going to be used for it. That being said, there's ongoing research in using a Brexafungurp and some more resistant complicated fungal infections. So if I had to envision some sort of place in therapy for it moving forward, it's probably not going to be VBC and might be in some of those other types of more complicated fungal infections. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to esophagitis. So this is going to be an overgrowth of candida within the esophagus. What you'll have as far as symptoms can be things like dysphagia and white plaques on exam. Risk factors are particularly going to be HIV, which goes hand in hand with that immunosuppression. Um, so HIV and esophagitis, uh, for a long time, we've thought of them as kind of going hand in hand as far as a new diagnosis. So in a person with no other known immunosuppression who's young and healthy, they show up with esophagitis, they should definitely be tested for HIV, just to rule that out as a cause. And as far as the diagnosis, once again, we're looking at physical exam and potentially a positive culture. But here on this next slide, as you can see, it's not exactly a subtle thing to see on physical exam. So if you're looking down the esophagus, you can see those white plaques there. Normally that should just be like pink, healthy, normal tissue. As far as treatment, we're typically looking at oral fluconazole for a 14 day duration. So longer than what we see with BBC because this one is a little bit more difficult to treat. And in the setting of a patient with new HIV, we also want to ensure that we're starting antiretroviral therapy to reverse that immunosuppression. And if they're immunosuppressed for some other reason, so say like post-transplant or something, we might think about knocking down some of those immunosuppressive agents and reducing a dose if possible. But that's got to be within the holistic picture of caring for that patient um, because esophagitis tends to be bothersome, but not something that's particularly dangerous. All right, so turning our attention to intra-abdominal candidiasis. So what we see with candida infections of the intra-abdominal space is no specific symptoms outside of what we would see with bacterial infections. We've probably got pain, we may have abscess formation, what have you, we can see a myriad of different presentations. As far as the risk factors though for candida actually being part of an intra-abdominal infection, 
would be we're looking for things like more severe infection, potentially hospital acquired infection, and especially this one is huge surgical or bowel manipulation. So the more infections a patient has had, the more antibiotic exposure, the more um, operations potentially introducing something into that space, the more likely it is that candida may become a player in that situation. Once again, as far as diagnosis, our physical exam and potentially imaging findings will be huge there. And then positive culture is another thing that can play in here. But the technique of how we collect that culture does really matter. Because if you recall earlier, we talked about how this is a space that could potentially be colonized. So when we look at guideline recommendations, they recommend to really hone in on how that culture was collected from an intra-abdominal space to help interpret whether candida could truly be a pathogen. So if a patient already has some sort of existing intra-abdominal drain and we go ahead and just culture from that drain, there's a high likelihood that candida will grow, but it very likely could just be colonizing that drain itself and isn't actually the cause of an infection. However, if we see some sort of fluid or abscess, something like that, where we can go in and aspirate it or place a new drain, and that brand spanking new culture does grow Canada, then that's much less likely to be a colonizer at that point, and we probably really will treat it as a true pathogen. So when it comes to empiric therapy and management of Canada in the intra-abdominal space, we're typically looking at echinocandins, which is going to be anindulofungin, capsofungin, mycofungin, and our newest agent, redzofungin. And if we have a susceptible isolate, we'll oftentimes step down to fluconazole therapy thereafter. Uh, but that's going to be probably contingent on exactly what type of candida grows. We'll typically go a little bit more broad as far as our candida coverage up front with that echinocandin. So shifting gears, once again, we'll go ahead and talk about candidemia. So again, growth of candida species from the blood culture. Now, in this situation, that candidemia is probably almost always coming from somewhere else. Usually we do not have spontaneous infection of the blood culture. We still need to kind of think about the source of that candidemia and there are sometimes situations where we can't actually figure it out, but we should be looking for that as much as we're able to. The thing that I tend to see the most commonly is often Canada-related bloodstream infections secondary to a line. So I know we've got a lot of IP folks on the call. That's definitely an infection that's near and dear to all of your hearts as well. So as far as symptoms of candidemia, we're going to see general things like fever, hypotension, potentially progression to septic shock, and once again, risk factors, a huge part is going to be central lines, which is where line care really comes into play as far as trying to decrease that risk of subsequent candidemia. Additionally, we have total parenteral nutrition, so TPNs is going to be a huge risk factor for candidemia. So even though TPN is there to feed the patient, that's a great growth medium for things like Canada and bacteria as well. So it does a great job feeding those organisms. So that's one of the reasons we do really try to, as much as we're able, get patients to things like enteral feeding rather than utilizing TPN because it's just more of an infection risk. And then last, we do have antibiotic exposure. Um, and this is something that I think of as more being like a correlation rather than a true causation. Um, but if you think about it, we do have potentially alterations in the normal flora once again, but especially if you're getting lots and lots of antibiotics, as well as say TPN, we're accessing that line again and again and again. And every time we access it, there's a potential risk of introducing some other sort of organism. So just something to keep in mind there. As far as diagnosis, we're going to typically, once again, be looking for positive cultures, which is going to be our absolute gold standard as far as diagnosing candidemia. We do also have other types of tests, which include things like a T2 panel um, and beta deglucan, but these are usually not what we're going to be using as much, and in fact, not really something that we use as part of our standard of care here at Norton Healthcare, at least. There's other approaches out there um, and other facilities that might use them more commonly, but once again, that positive growth of candida species from the blood culture is still going to be the gold standard across any healthcare facility. 
So once again, when it comes to treatment, we're going to be typically looking at a echinocandin as far as empiric therapy, and we're going to be treating for at least 14 days from a negative culture. So we'll go ahead and repeat blood cultures until we have no further growth of candida, and then that starts our day one of therapy to count out to that 14 or more, depending on if a patient has a truly complicated infection, some sort of uncontrolled source, um, but that's going to be our minimum. Once again, we can see fluconazole as a step-down therapy. Um, so once again, looking for probably a truly susceptible isolate, but we're going to have to wait a little bit on that. And then potentially in situations where you have treatment failure, we might start to see therapies like amphotericin B, which we'll discuss a little bit more in depth in our treatment section. So as far as candidemia, I just wanted to walk through how we get to our empiric therapy choice with that echinocandin. So Dr. Junkins put up a little bit more detailed version of this chart. I went ahead and simplified it a little bit, but this is looking at an example of types of candidemias that have been seen within the last year at a health system. So what you'll notice is the most frequently isolated one was what's now known as Nicosiomyces glabrata, but was once Canada glabrata. And that one is actually resistant to fluconazole. So that's one of the reasons we wouldn't want to start out with empiric fluconazole is our most frequently isolated Canada subtype is actually resistant. We can also see that what was formerly known as Canada cruzii is also resistant, but that's not contributing nearly as many percentage of isolates. So that's not really the primary driving force in our uh, antibiotics, or excuse me, antifungal selection at that point. Now, when it comes to candidemia, there is this question in the IDSA guidelines on candidiasis that brings up if we should use prophylaxis in ICU patients. The thought is that they're very high risk for candidemia because they have a lot of those other risk factors. And the guidelines don't actually provide a definitive recommendation. They say if candidemia is occurring greater than 5% of patients in an ICU, that it could be reasonable to consider it. Um, this, of course, is something that has to be balanced. So when we look at the data where ICUs use prophylaxis, so typically in a kind of candid, in their ICU patient population, we do see that they decrease their occurrence of candidemias. So that is out there. That is not exclusive in all the studies. You can see some mixed data, but there is data demonstrating that benefit. However, there is a concern definitely for increased resistance. So the more and more and more antifungals we give, the more and more likely we are to develop resistance. And especially when we're all very aware of things like Canada auris, we know that antifungal resistance and resistant subspecies really is a problem and is something that we're maybe not that well equipped to confront moving forward. So that is, for me, a huge concern with this type of practice. Additionally, in some of these studies that look at that prophylaxis in ICU patients, we don't really see any impact on mortality. So that is one of the things that matters the most to me when it comes to taking care of my patients. It's, if not, probably really the most important thing is what actually happened to the patient at the end. So even in those situations where we might be decreasing the infections, we're seemingly not really impacting that ultimate mortality impact. So we don't utilize widespread ICU prophylaxis here at Norton Healthcare. There are definitely different approaches and they can all be appropriate depending on what's actually going on in your healthcare facility. But these are kind of the things that I would weigh the risk versus benefit when trying to answer that question of should we or shouldn't we do this? All right. So we'll go ahead and shift our attention to just a brief overview of these various antifungal treatments that we've kind of hit on so far. So fluconazole is going to be one of our most commonly utilized agents. Um, once again, we see it as first line or step down therapy in all types of fungal infections. As far as adverse events, one of the huge ones is QTC prolongation, which can put patients at risk of arrhythmias. You can also see like rash, dermatologic things, hepatotoxicity and harm in pregnancy. When it comes to medication interactions, things we worry about are other QTC prolonging meds, so anything that's kind of stacking that risk. 
It also can wreak havoc on warfarin, which we're seeing fewer and fewer patients on warfarin for anticoagulation as new and easier to tolerate drugs have come out. But we do definitely still have patients on warfarin and fluconazole is one that could definitely change their INR. And last, we also have hepatic metabolism. So for any of the pharmacists on the line, I know they're familiar with CYP3A4 enzymes, which are one of the main types of enzymes that metabolize all sorts of different things, but definitely lots of drugs. As far as monitoring, we're looking at liver function tests, as well as BMPs, so we can do our renal dose adjustments, uh, which are required on fluconazole. Then I went ahead and just lumped all of our other azol antifungals together. So fluconazole is going to be the workhorse, particularly when it comes to Canada infections. These other azoles, which include foriconazole, itraconazole, hosaconazole, and isobuconazole, tend to not really be used so much for our more simple Canada infections. They tend to really find their niche in other types of fungal infections. But for the sake of completeness, I just wanted to make sure that we've mentioned them. As far as adverse effects, they're generally going to be similar to fluconazole, but a couple things I wanted to call out is the exception of isa fluconazole, which actually causes QTC shortening instead of lengthening, unlike the rest of the class. And then voriconazole can also cause some visual changes, which can be very bizarre. So it can be sometimes like color disruption, but it can also be things like hallucinations. Um, and this can happen relatively quickly with exposure to the drug. So that is just a really funky thing to kind of watch out for. Moving on to our echinocandins. Generally, these are very well tolerated. I actually, when I was making the slides, had to kind of rack my brain and think about um, actually looking some stuff up to remind myself of what can potentially go wrong with echinocandins. I, um, to date so far, have not ever really had a patient who's had an issue tolerating this medication. We can see some increase in LFTs, but it's not something that I've ever actually seen happen. So I think of this as being much more common with the azole antifungals. However, we can also see harm in pregnancy. So this has been demonstrated in animal studies previously, and it's recommended to avoid the echinocandins in the setting of pregnancy. As far as interactions, once again, I kind of had to rack my brain here a little bit. Uh, they tend to be a lot cleaner of drugs than the azoles as well. Um, but what I did come up with is an interaction with Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a type of probiotic. You might know it as Floristore is the brand name. Um, now that is actually going to be true of all antifungals because Saccharomyces is in fact a fungus. So in this situation, sometimes people want to give probiotics. However, if we're using something that will actually kill that probiotic product, then it's probably not actually doing what we're intending it to do because not enough of the organism is likely to survive to actually have any sort of effect. Uh, so that's just something to kind of be aware of if people are trying to promote probiotics is having some sense of, are we actually giving something that's going to directly counteract it? Another interaction we can potentially see is serolimus, uh, but in all honesty, lots of patients are not on serolimus and we can go ahead and dose adjust um, for that medication as well. So not usually a huge deal. As far as monitoring, we're going to be looking at liver function tests and the echinocandins don't require renal dose adjustment. So that makes it pretty easy on this pharmacy side of things. In contrast, we then have amphotericin B. Now amphotericin B does get a bad rap. It tends to be nicknamed amphoterrible B in the setting of pharmacy, but that's only really because it has a lot of adverse effects and can be more difficult for patients to tolerate. That being said, it of course still has a place in therapy. So the big one that we tend to worry about is infusion-related reactions. So this can be things like flushing, and it can also have rigors where patients are really, really shaky afterwards. Now, these infusion reactions are things that we can try to manage by pre-medicating. So we'll typically give acetaminophen, Benadryl, and try to ensure that that doesn't happen. We can also potentially manage the rigors with meperidine after the drug has been infused. Uh, and it does typically get better after the first infusion. However, it can be really bothersome for patients, even if it's not dangerous, it is pretty uncomfortable. 
The other huge one is going to be nephrotoxicity as well as electrolyte disturbances, which primarily are going to be potassium and magnesium. As far as interactions, once again, as much as we're able to, we try to avoid risk stacking. So we don't want to give it with a lot of other nephrotoxic medications. And blood pressure lowering agents are also one that it's recommended to use caution. And that's more so related to some of those infusion reactions may also drop the blood pressure a little bit. Um, as far as monitoring though, we're looking for a complete metabolic panel uh, because we want to have a little bit more information. So that's going to help us do our renal dose adjustments, potassium and magnesium. So we can kind of keep an eye on there and ensure that we replace those electrolytes as appropriate. Now, I mentioned that it does have a lot of side effects, but what you'll notice about amphotericin B is it's actually safe in pregnancy. So if we have a pregnant patient, that is where amphotericin B is probably really potentially going to come into play as far as management of a candida infection. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind, even though we might say it's terrible, it's really, really great in that situation. So last, I'll just mention a brexifungrip again. You all already got to hear some of my gripes about it um, as far as what kind of brought it to market, but we'll go ahead and just quickly discuss some of the same information here. So adverse effects, we can see commonly diarrhea, abdominal pain, headache, and once again, harm in pregnancy. So this is again, based on animal studies. As far as interactions, once again, we see those CYP3A4 liver metabolism interactions and monitoring. We look for a BMP because it does require renal dose adjustment. And this one specifically actually recommends to do a pregnancy test prior to use because we, again, we can have that risk of harm in pregnancy. So just to avoid um, any potential there, that's the recommendation on the package insert. Those are some references. And at this point, I will open it up for questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, next week, we'll have Clay Bryant uh, talking about uh, HAI data. And uh, we'll see everybody uh, next week. Thank you. Thanks.